it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Time to blast off for Planet America. I'm John Barrett. And I'm Chad Lichardello. This week, we're going to have a look at the impact of the Texas abortion ban as some doctors go into hiding while others dob themselves in for breaking the law. And we're going to have updates on COVID boosters, the Afghan drone strike, and a bunch of malarkey about salad dressing. But first... Break it down. In what looked for all the world like a Hollywood Western movie invading a news story, this week Stetson and chap-wearing cowboys were sent to round up mostly Haitian asylum seekers like errant steers as they were trying to make their way into the United States across the Rio Grande River, seemingly whipping them with their reins. The head of the Department of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mallorca, says he's horrified. Any mistreatment or abuse of a migrant is unacceptable is against Border Patrol policy, training, and our department's values. Indeed, we have directed an investigation. That investigation is underway. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki also says it is unacceptable. I don't think anyone seeing that footage uh, would think it was acceptable or appropriate. And Vice President Kamala Harris, who has been tasked with trying to fix the surge of migrants, wants answers. What I saw depicted about um, those individuals on horseback treating human beings the way they were is horrible. And um, I fully support what is happening right now, which is a thorough investigation into exactly what is going on there. Um, but human beings should never be treated that way. Vice President Harris says she understands what's driving Haitians to try and reach the United States now. Talk about a country that has just experienced so much uh, tragedy that has been about natural disasters that the, that the head of state assassinated. And we really have to do a lot more to recognize that as a member of the Western Hemisphere, we've got to support some very basic needs that the people of Haiti have. So some fairly compassionate rhetoric at least. How's that going down over on Fox and Friends though? The border is still at crisis. Uh, no sign of the president of the United States. He's still vacationing. Uh, the borders are Kamala Harris is flipping coins at football games. They love the Where's Kamala thing on mm. Fox and Friends. Now, look, I've got to get in here, though. I know those pics of the Cowboys definitely did not look great, but I'm not aware of any actual whipping people with reins going on. Here's the video of the main offenders. As you can see, the agents are doing some very weird spinny thing with their reins. Border protection say that agents sometimes spin their reins to deter people from getting too close to the horse, because if they get too close, the horse can step on them and break bones. They say they aren't aware of anyone being struck with the reins. Now, that's what they say. You look at the video again, you decide for yourself if you think they were a bit over the top or not. Yes, John. well, I guess perception is probably a little bit more powerful than reality here and the line between spinning and flicking and whipping. <laughs> White men on horseback uh, basically looking as though they are mistreating brown people who are trying to get into the United States. There's a bit of cultural baggage associated with those images for sure. And the other defining image as well, uh, not being perceived too well around what is now being described as a border crisis in the media. Thousands of Haitians sheltering from the heat under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas. In recent days, the crowd of migrants in the Texas border town swelled to more than 14,000. They sheltered under and near this Del Rio bridge. They had been waiting to be processed, but in squalid and sweltering conditions and with food and supplies constantly running short. No hay suficiente comida para... There is not enough food to give to everybody who is inside there. We need to get out of the camp to look for food. So what on the camera looks like a flood of people coming across the river and then hoarding under a bridge someplace. Or in fact, people who are trying to stay cool and stay alive while they await processing, although most of them are about to discover they're going to be sent straight back to their country of origin, in most cases with this uh, group Haiti. Now, the concern as well that COVID-19 could be spreading in those squalid conditions under the bridge, that is now being used by the Biden administration to clear the people away quickly, invoking a public health order known as Title 42 to deport these immigrants as quickly as possible. This is a practice that began last year under the Trump administration. And Republican Senator Lindsey Graham this week found a pretty nifty way as well to stop anybody feeling too sorry for them. How easy would it be for a terrorist group 
to hire some cartel to take them into the United States to the southern border, get in the middle of this humanity. Thanks for the tip, Lindsay. I don't know about you, though. I, I, would, I would expect that uh, border control agents would probably be able to sort the Haitian asylum seekers from the potential Afghan terrorists, and they may even be able to find a medical professional qualified to stick a swab up somebody's nose or a jab in their arm. But I don't know. After seeing those cowboys on horseback, who knows anymore, Chuck? <laughs> Look, I might take a couple of steps back here to give some extra context, because last week we heard the news that 208,000 people were apprehended on the southern border just in August alone. 208,000, that's a lot of people. And in the post-recession period, the last few months have really stood out. Look at that blue line. In fact, this year's results stand out in any period. We have one month left in the fiscal year, and it now appears certain that we'll see the most southern border apprehensions ever. Although, admittedly, 44% of last month's border crosses were immediately deported using the aforementioned public health order, Title 42. They say it's for COVID reasons. We'll come back to that one in a second. But in this context, the administration stopped deportation flights to Haiti after the assassination of the Haitian president in July and then an earthquake in August. The administration decided to extend temporary protection status as well for any Haitian migrants that were already in America at that point in time. Now, that was back in August. Not much happened until last week, for whatever reason. That is when the Haitian migrants started making their way across the Rio Grande, you saw that before, walking up this road you see now to the bridge that's coming up there, and that's when they claimed asylum. They went from about 700 migrants under the bridge last week to scenes like this, actually filmed by Ted Cruz of all people, <laughs> about 16,000 migrants all in one week. And they, as John said, were mostly Haitians. 16,000 migrants, 22 portable toilets, no running water. Not very nice. And that is when the federal government swung into action by cracking down on the media. We just learned that the FAA has put out a temporary flight restriction, a TFR, in the area immediately around the port of entry where that bridge is. What does that mean? It means our drone can no longer fly and show those images. It's a two-week TFR, and according to the FAA, it's for special security reasons. Those good old special security reasons <laughs> rear their head again. But the Texas law enforcement people tried to block the migrants' path with their cars. Didn't really work, so then the Department of Homeland Security Secretary came on over the top. If you come to the United States illegally, you will be returned. Your journey will not succeed and you will be endangering your life and your family's lives. That's a pretty unequivocal statement. Except the Border Patrol chief was saying something completely different. He said that single adult men would be expelled via Title 42 back to Haiti, but most family units would be processed and released into America. Turns out the Border Chief was right. 320 Haitians were indeed immediately placed on planes and expelled back to Haiti, yes. Another six planes were expected to leave on Tuesday and then 10 every day after. So that's about a thousand people a day being deported. Of course, once those people landed in Haiti, they would find themselves in a country utterly devoid of the resources and infrastructure to receive them. Many of them didn't even know that they were gonna get deported and they hadn't been in Haiti for years. They might have a good reason to flee Haiti, but no one even asked them. That's how things went for those people. For a bunch of other Haitians, though, they were released into the community on, quote, a very, very large scale, apparently in their, quote, thousands. They were merely given a notice to appear at an immigration office within 60 days. No, that isn't even a date for an immigration court appearance because that would have taken too much processing time. They wanted to get them out of there. And if you want to know just how many thousands of people we're talking about here who were released, well, within 48 hours, 16,000 migrants had become 6,700 migrants, and less than 2,000 of them would have had time to have been deported at that point. 
So this is the game they play on the border, John. Some people get bounced immediately under Tile 42, no questions asked, and some people get released into the community without so much as a court date. It's a wonderful way to annoy activists on both sides of the immigration debate. I'm not sure the party's going to last much longer, though. There's a court case at the moment making very ominous sounds about the administration's use or misuse of Title 42. Indeed there is, Chaz. And for more on that, we're joined by Lee Gallant. He's one of the top lawyers at the American Civil Liberties Union, and he's brought a whole lot of cases against immigration measures, including Trump's Muslim ban, family separations, and now the use of the Title 42 health orders to deport people. Lee Glenn, welcome to Planned America. Thanks for having me. So, Lee, how concerned are you that these images that we're all seeing of thousands of Haitian immigrants huddled under a bridge in Del Rio, is this going to add to the urgency of border officials to get them out of town and send them home without due process? Uh, we are extremely concerned for a number of reasons. To begin with, the image of police on horses rounding up black immigrants with what appear to be whips is horrific. The camps and the conditions are horrific. But I think the point that's critical for people to understand is that the Haitians are being expelled without process, but that's just a small subset of the people who are being expelled without process under what's called the Title 42 policy started by President Trump, but unfortunately continued by President Biden. What that policy says is because of COVID, we are not going to allow asylum seekers to even have a hearing. Now, we think, as the public health officials have said, this is completely pretextual. There can be safe processing as long as basic mitigation steps have taken. We are glad that people are finally noticing. Unfortunately, it's because of the horrific conditions under the bridge in Del Rio, Texas. But this has been going on now for a year under President Trump and for eight months under President Biden, hundreds of thousands of people are being expelled without process. Now, Lee, the Del Rio Bridge went from sheltering 1,000 people to sheltering about 16,000 people in one week. It is true the Biden administration did halt deportations back to Haiti before then, and they also extended temporary protection visas for people from Haiti before then as well. But that was back in August, like six weeks ago. So where did all these people come from in just this week? Surely there must have been some kind of plan or trigger that prompted it. Yeah, what the trigger is, we're still not sure. We're investigating exactly what happened. Um, We'll have, we'll have to see why it happened, uh, what, what triggered, whether there was change of policy in Mexico or a perception that there was a change of policy or what exactly happened. We are not sure, um, but one way or the other, we have to get to the bottom of it. But more importantly, we can't be treating the Haitians in, in, under the bridge like the way we are, and we can't continue to deport them like we can't deport the other people without process. It's not a matter of whether we can ultimately deport people who lose their asylum hearings. It's a matter of whether they get some process. And right now, they're getting zero process. And, Lee, what rights do these people have, either under international or domestic law? Or, or does the use of Title 42 just overrule any of those other rights? So they have a clear right under domestic and international law to asylum hearings and convention against torture hearings. The government has taken the position, though, that they can override those mandatory rights based on the public health laws in what's called Title 42. Our position is that Title 42 does not allow them to expel people and certainly doesn't override the asylum protections. And that's the very issue that's before the court now is can the government use Title 42 to expel people and do so over the mandatory protections in the law for asylum seekers. Now, with that court action you're working on, I know the judge has an order out to stop a whole bunch of deportations under Title 42, but is that entirely all deportations or just for certain groups? Right now, the lawsuit is about families. Um, we ultimately want to see it stop for adults, but the immediate action was for families. And on the 30th, the government will have to stop removing families without process under Title 42 unless the appeals court 
or after that, the U.S. Supreme Court says they continue doing it. So there is going to be an enormous moment coming up to see whether the appeals court will allow them to continue it. If the appeals court doesn't allow them to continue this expulsion policy, the Biden administration will face the choice of whether to go to the U.S. Supreme Court to defend one of the most extreme Trump era policies. Uh, we hope the appeals court sides with us. And then if they do, we hope the Biden administration will do what's right and accept the ruling. But is there, though, any kind of valid public health concern here, given that we've got thousands of people uh, being processed in a way that clearly the system isn't coping with them if they're all under a bridge someplace? Well, to begin with, the government doesn't have to detain anyone. And there is now ready availability of testing and vaccines in the United States. And so we do not think it's a, it's a public health crisis. And more importantly, the public health community here in the United States has repeatedly said that asylum seekers can be safely processed. And notably, the Centers for Disease Control, on which the Biden administration is relying, did not say that asylum seekers cannot be safely processed given testing and quarantine and the vaccines available. It simply said the Biden administration has refused to take the necessary health mitigation steps. And so that, in our view, is clearly something that they're doing, the Biden administration is doing, not for public health reasons, but because of either political reasons or border enforcement. Now, the Biden administration appears to me to be quite two-paced when it comes to border enforcement. Either they're rejecting you without even asking a question, or they're allowing you into the country to roam free without sometimes even a notice to appear in court. What's your view about the way they treat the people they don't deport? Do you have any questions about that treatment? Well, I think that they need to get organized and get the proper resources there. We have no problem with them issuing notices to appear. We do believe, based on past practice under the Obama administration, families will appear for their asylum hearings. And so I, I think the right thing is to release families, not to detain them, but to give them the necessary paperwork and make it clear when they're supposed to return for their hearings. Families do not want to have to go undercover and live undercover with small children. They just want a chance to seek asylum, to make their case out, and that's all that needs to be done. Lee Gallant, thank you for being with us on Planet America. Thanks so much for having me and, and covering this issue. This week, America's Food and Drug Administration approved the use of the Pfizer vaccine as a booster shot for people over the age of 65 and those at highest risk of serious complications from COVID-19. And that's not just people with weakened immunity, it's for those whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure puts them at high risk. And studies do show immunity fading faster in people over the age of 80 as they develop lower levels of neutralising antibodies post-vaccination than younger adults do. That's the rationale. And the FDA advises that this booster shot should be given at least six months after the completion of the primary two doses of Pfizer vaccine. This approval, which earlier today was endorsed by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC as well, does not, however, extend to younger, healthier Americans. And that is a setback to plans from the Biden administration to start administering booster shots to all Americans this week. And he certainly wasn't hiding those plans, Joe Biden. Plan is for every, every adult to get a booster shot eight months after you got your second shot. That guy's pretty upfront, and if that wasn't hopeful enough, he said this a week later. This booster program is gonna start here on September the 20th, uh, pending approval of the FDA and the CDC committee of outside experts, and the, the question raised is, should it be shorter than eight months? Or should it be as little as five months? And that's being discussed. Five months, eh? Look, he did mention the CDC approval process, mm -hmm. but he still jumped the gun a fair bit there. Having said that, it is good to see they at least followed the science. Yeah, didn't have a lot of choice in that, <laughs> as it turns out. President Biden also convened a virtual COVID summit on the sidelines of this week's United Nations General Assembly meeting in New York, and all of a sudden he had a big announcement to make. Now he's got a whole bunch of extra Pfizer vaccines sitting around. The United States is buying another half billion doses of Pfizer to donate to low and middle income countries around the world. This is another half billion doses that will all be shipped by this time next year. And it's a pretty big deal, it's fair to say. It will take America's donated vaccines to in excess of 1.1 million. 
billion. That will be handy. Mm. If we look at the share of each continent at the moment, that's at least partly vaccinated. 59% of South America has had some kind of shot. 56% of North America and Europe have. 49% of Asia has. And 6.1% of Africa has been at least partly vaccinated. Pick the odd one out. The only problem is he's promising those vaccines will arrive sometime before September next year. So that's not ideal. Mind you, America's still got a bit of vaccine of its own to do. This week on the most vaccinated large countries list, the US has slipped down to number 37 in the world after it was passed by, wait for it, Japan, which only three months ago has been widely mocked for having massive issues with its own vaccination drive. Now they've left America in their dust. I know what you're thinking, though. Do you? Yes, I do. Try me out. How does America compare to us? Yes. Yeah! Well, if we combine the 56 states in America and Australia, New South Wales is now number 17, with 67% of its population being at least Ooh. partly vaccinated. That's only 10% behind the most vaccinated American state, Vermont. Victoria, not far behind at number 24, with Tasmania at number 27. And South Australia, Queensland and Western Australia are back amongst the red states, but they've put a bit of a gap on poor old Idaho at the bottom there. As far as the fully vaccinated goes, New South Wales is now at number 41 with a bullet and Tasmania not far behind. Hooray for us. Now, this week, the COVID pandemic in the United States passed another milestone, now officially having claimed more lives in the US than the deadly influenza outbreak beginning in 1918. The Centers for Disease Control estimate 675,000 Americans died of the H1N1 virus, commonly referred to as the Spanish flu, even though it may have originated at a US Army base in Kansas and taken to Europe by American troops towards the end of the war. The H1N1 flu was different to COVID in several ways it had a greater mortality rate amongst younger healthier people with stronger immunity people like soldiers and kids it turned their immune system against them around 500 million people or one third of the world's population at the time caught the Spanish flu and 10% of them 50 million died of it COVID deaths now stand at more than 4.6 million and the global population now is four times greater today. But one big difference now, of course, is we have several widely available vaccines for COVID. Researchers back in 1918 tried to create an effective flu vaccine, but they didn't even figure out that it was caused by a virus until the 1930s. And they had no antibiotics at the time to treat secondary bacterial infections that took a lot of lives, like pneumonia. The 1918 pandemic flu didn't just go away either, despite what you might hear. It did eventually mutate, though, into a milder version, which we still see today. H1N1 keeps coming back as the seasonal flu. So far, though, of course, it is mostly manageable. Experts hope that someday we'll be able to say the same about COVID. It's just like the flu for real this time. Hopefully. Uh, another difference we should say as well is that between now and then is that America's population is three times as much today as yeah. it was then as well. So when we're doing direct comparisons. But let's see how the numbers are going this week. And the short answer is crap. But the long answer is, unfortunately, Groundhog Day. The cases are stuck at around 150,000 for like the third or fourth week in a row. Hospitalizations are stuck at around 90,000 for the third or fourth week in a row. Deaths keep inching up to about 1,900 a day. Even worse, about half a million children were diagnosed in the previously finished week, which is not what you want to hear. Sadly for America, there isn't much point seeing this graph anymore that compares American state cases to Australian state cases. You can see Alaska's way out of control this week at the top there, but New South Wales is starting to improve and America is not starting to improve. In fact, it's going backwards a little bit. So we might put that comparison away next time and unfortunately no longer applies. What this all leads to, unfortunately, is more health rationing, with hospitals now rationing care in Idaho as well as parts of Alaska and now Montana as well. And just to hammer home what this means, if two super sick people front up in an Idaho hospital for any reason whatsoever, doctors now use the following checklist to determine who will get the care and who will not. Question one. Is one of them younger than 17? Is one of them more than 28 weeks pregnant? Is one of them in a lower age band than the other? 
if they're both the same age, is one of them a public health worker? And if none of those questions separates the two patients, they're put into a lottery. And someone is going to be very, very unlucky. That is what's happening in Idaho hospitals right now, Idaho being the least vaccinated state. Mm. Get vaccinated. Yeah. Turns out those death panels that Sarah Palin was talking about all those years ago are a real thing. Mm. She's refusing to get vaccinated, by the way, mm. as well. Don't be Sarah Palin. Mm. This week, Dr Alan Braid, a practising physician for almost half a century, wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post. He explained in it why he had violated what he described as the extreme abortion ban in the state of Texas. Early this month, you'll recall, this law, SB8, came into effect mandating that any pregnancy in which a heartbeat is detected cannot be aborted, meaning that if you are more than six weeks pregnant, you cannot have an abortion in Texas under any circumstances. Dr Braid announced in this op-ed, after the law came into place, he provided an abortion to a woman who, though still in her first trimester, was beyond the state's new limit. Because, he says, he has a duty of care to his patient and his patient has a fundamental right to receive that care. But under the new Texas law, any private citizen in America who thinks that somebody like Dr Braid has performed an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy can sue them for at least $10,000. And just to be clear, Dr. Braid did perform an ultrasound on the fetus and it did detect cardiac activity. So there's no loopholes there. There is no doubt he was in breach of SB8. Also to be clear, that law, SB8, has now led to Texas women who are more than six weeks pregnant facing a drive of 247 miles on average to get an abortion. 14 times the distance they faced a month ago. Yeah, well, the lawsuits have started this week. The first from a disbarred former attorney who, a little confusingly, says he's not actually against abortion. I can see what the uh, proponents of uh, SB8, Texas SB8, were after. They wanted to insulate a legislative enactment from judicial review, and I think that's just wrong. I think it's totally wrong. Still, his lawsuit is one of two, according to Bayer County Records. The Texas Tribune reporting the second plaintiff, Felipe Gomez of Illinois, lists himself as pro-choice. That second plaintiff, by the way, is also a disbarred former attorney. <laughs> They'll do anything to get back into court. <laughs> well, but that first guy's a bit interesting. Uh, his complaint describes himself as, quote, currently on home confinement, serving the 12th year of a 15-year federal sentence on utterly fraudulent federal <laughs> charges of tax evasion and conspiracy. Even so, the final judgment and commitment order was based upon false testimony and claimed evidence, which was clearly contradicted by the record, etc. All of which the government steadfastly refuses to acknowledge and correct, despite ethical obligations so to do. Well, that law does allow anyone who isn't a government worker to sue. And that guy is indeed anyone. <laughs> I guess he meets <laughs> that low bar. So the first two people suing Dr Braid actually agree <laughs> with Dr Braid. They're hoping their cases will fail. And the courts look at these crazy guys and say, strike it down. But in the meantime, Right to Life groups are preparing their own legal action. And this week, the United States Supreme Court announced it will hear arguments in a Mississippi case which is banning abortions after 15 weeks. That's still a full seven weeks before a fetus is deemed viable and able to survive outside the womb. And that, of course, all goes to challenge the landmark 1973 Roe v Wade decision, which has been the test so far. It found that a woman has a constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy any time in the first six months of that pregnancy. In a moment, we will speak to a Texas doctor and abortion provider about how this new law is affecting her practice and her patients. But first, let's go to Danielle White. She's special counsel with the pro-life organisation Heartbeat International. Danielle White, thank you for joining us on Planet America. Thank you for having me. What about this Texas law itself? Are you comfortable with the way that it essentially incentivises private citizens with no standing to go after a $10,000 bounty by dobbing in a doctor who may have performed a termination after six weeks? What this law really does is it fixes a perverse loophole in our system where only abortionists can walk into court and assert the rights of a pregnant woman. And we know that the interests of pregnant women are not limited to obtaining an abortion. Women have all kinds of different desired outcomes for their pregnancies. But right now, the only one that can be 
protected in the name of women in court is an abortion by those abortionists who, by the way, stand to benefit from her abortion decision. So what this law does is it allows other people to step up and to assert her rights and to assert the rights of the unborn child in this situation, because this really does involve not just her, but her unborn child as well. Danielle, I understand your point about the loophole, but doesn't this law create its own loophole in that any random person can sue anyone who's performed an abortion, even if they have nothing to do with that abortion at all, even if they're in a different state? Isn't that a rather large loophole? Well, perhaps, but I think that what we have to remember is that abortion jurisprudence is replete with loopholes here in the United States. There's all kinds of different exceptions that apply in the abortion context that also don't apply in other civil contexts here. At the same time, this, this law is not unlike the False Claims Act, which allows other parties to assert interests and then even recover damages if they are correct that, for example, the defendant is defrauding the government. And so there are other instances in the law where we allow people who might not even be related to the situation to step in and assert interests. Now, this loophole that we're talking about uh, is used to stop people defending what, at least right now, the Supreme Court regards as a constitutional right right now, that might change. But doesn't this whole technicality bother you? Because that same technicality could one day be used to mess with some other constitutional rights, like say, religious freedom. You know, it really doesn't because I think that there are all kinds of ways that the law can work in order to protect that. We haven't seen, um, we haven't seen any attempts to, to do that, to mess with the religious freedom right. And I think that the right to religious freedom is also much more concrete in the in the US Constitution. Like you mentioned, we're going to see some changes potentially to the abortion jurisprudence here. But the right to religious freedom, for example, is explicitly stated in the Constitution, whereas the abortion right is much more nebulous, much more tentative, and has been subject to change over the decades. And, Danielle, it was announced this week that the Supreme Court will start hearing arguments in that Mississippi case uh, in December, seen as one of the more likely challenges to Roe versus Wade. How likely do you think that is to succeed at this point? Well, it's such an interesting question. It's a, it's a really uh, unique time in American history. I think that it's fairly likely that the court is going to tinker with the law. We'll see. Um, I, I think that it's going to be difficult for them to try... And if they were to overturn Roe versus Wade, it's actually a little bit cleaner because the precedent has said that um, pre-viability bans on abortions are not permitted. And so the court is a little bit on the horns of a dilemma here. They can either um, overturn Roe versus Wade or they can decline to overturn Roe versus Wade, but they're going to have to come up with some other test, some other um, standard and the court is usually reticent to just invent standards. At least this particular court is reticent to uh, invent, invent standards out of whole cloth. And so it's going to be very, very interesting to see what they ultimately decide to do. Now, I know Catholics have been ultra consistent on the morality of abortion, but 50 years ago, abortion was a lot less of an issue for a lot of Christian denominations. Why do you think that was? You know, I think over time, people became a little bit more aware of the abortion issue and what was what was really going on. I think also uh, over the Roe v. Wade case itself was kind of predicated on some of these um, more obscure abortion scenarios. And what we've come to see is that in reality, over 98% of abortions in the United States have turned out to be just simply elective. Um, I think there's also been a lot of scientific and medical progress that has shown us the the life in the womb. I mean, you look at an ultrasound from 30 years ago and there's not nearly as much to see as what you can see today on an ultrasound with our impressive technology. And so as we have come to a more mature understanding of, of what's actually happening in this situation and how we can step in and come alongside women, I think people are changing their minds about abortion. Danielle White, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. And now to Dr Jessica Rubino. She is a family medicine physician at an abortion clinic in Austin, Texas. 
Dr. Rubino, welcome to Plant America. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Dr. Rubino, there's no more theory. You are living the reality of life under SB8. So what effect has this law had on your practice? It has been quite a devastating impact. Um, first of all, just based on the numbers of people that we see, before this law went into effect, typically I would not see very many people who are under the six weeks that the ban requires. I mean, it's gotta be less than 10% of my practice. And so it's just been a devastating blow to the number of people we're able to see. And then therefore that means we're turning away all of those people. Um, leading into when SB actually went into effect was about as stressful as now that it's gone into effect, to be honest. Um, in the couple weeks leading up was when we had to start telling patients, you know, you need to come in for your appointment at this time after the state, you know, may not be available. And to have to tell people that, to have to discuss that with people, to have to explain to them that they are not going to have bodily autonomy after a date um, in our entire state is, um, it's very bleak. And you can tell people have just become very desperate. And doctor, can you tell us a little bit about the security situation for abortion providers in Texas now? We already have a situation where in the south of the United States, we worry about our safety as providers anyway. We still have threats um, to our safety, to our clinic safety, um, just in general. But then as this was going into effect, we have been even more worried. We worry that because the law specifically instructs citizens to get involved to sort of come after us um, with lawsuits that also you know gives the impression that we're people that are worthy of coming after and so i think all of us have been on edge you know even more so than than we normally are doctor have you or other doctors that you know felt any pressure to not only stop conducting abortions after six weeks of pregnancy but stop conducting abortions altogether it it feels oppressive in a way that makes you want to quit. I can tell you that for sure. It, when you are told you can't do your job, and not only can you not do your job, that's your livelihood in the way that you're supposed to be practicing, you have to actively go against the Hippocratic Oath, which says to do only do good um, and not do harm. And when I can actively see that we're doing harm by turning people away for a safe medical um, procedure, uh, it, it's hard to... Um, it's hard to keep going. And it's also made it so that, like I said, we have to worry, you know, then I work at a private clinic. So the number of my patients has gone down dramatically. That also affects the business. And obviously to me, that's secondary, but it's really important for us to be able to keep our doors open, you know, going forward. Now, we've all heard that Texas doctor, Dr. Alan Braid, has uh, been quite open about the fact that he has conducted an abortion uh, for somebody who was over six weeks pregnant since this came in, so an illegal abortion. Do you think he's alone in that or are other abortion providers doing that as well right now? I just want to say I'm very grateful to Dr. Braid for doing that, for stepping in the path of this horrible law, um, because that's going to allow it to move through the courts. And people deserve access in the communities where they are. They deserve access to abortion care. Um, I hope that we can get back to that soon. What percentage of your clients would you say even knew they were pregnant by six weeks? Ooh, that's, it's low. I mean, it's definitely less than 10%. And I think I'm being really generous there. Um, it is, it is just not that common. <laughs> And what percentage of your clients would you say have the ability to travel the 250 miles or whatever it is to get an abortion now? This is one of my biggest worries because people will often come at us with, well, they can just travel out of state. And not only is Texas a very large state and that's a long way to travel, but there are so many factors that go into being able to do that. And especially living in a post-pandemic world where people who are hit economically hard are not on the upswing yet. Um, and we know that, and we know that it's gonna impact those people more. So I would not be surprised to find that it's a very small percentage that are actually able to get out. Um, I would say if we just look at percentage of people with um, who are having any economic trouble um, that come to the clinic, I mean, that's a really large percentage of the patients I see. And so I, I know that those are the people that are not gonna be able to get, to get out. And so, Doctor, for those who are unable to leave the state in order to get an abortion, uh, what are their options? Are they now just required to take that pregnancy to full term? Not always. Um, that is what 
will likely happen for a good portion of them, a significant portion will be pushed into forced birth um, in Texas where our maternal mortality rates are not great. So, so that's one issue. But then we know also some people, especially when they're desperate, will try to do an abortion at home. And an abortion at home in some places with the right support and medication and knowing how far along you are in pregnancy can be done safely. So that's something that we know, but we also know that there are people who are at certain stages of pregnancy where that is not safe or who may need follow-up care once they have started the process and it would be safe if they had good follow-up care. But if they don't, then we're stuck in a place where now things have gotten very dangerous. And that's what I'm the most, that's what I'm the most worried about. And what effect has this law had on the state of mind of your patients? This law has been really devastating um, to even the mental state of people. So whenever someone is already seeking an abortion, we know that oftentimes, not always, they have other things going on in their lives. It's the reason they're seeking the abortion. And so they are already in perhaps a stress situation. And if that's, we're also talking about people who have been, you know, some of them who have been traumatized, victimized, and that's why they're there for their abortion. So we're talking about all of those people who already have all of that stress and that heartache and everything, then also now being told that you need to either leave the state or continue your pregnancy to term, and those are your only options. And it always impacts people who do not have as many economic resources as others. It always impacts them more. And so that's just going to continue to double down on those same people. And Dr. Rubino, coming up as well in the next uh, couple of months, there's this Mississippi case to go before the Supreme Court, which could, uh, in effect, overturn the Roe versus Wade decision. So what does the future look like in the United States if all abortion after 15 weeks is made illegal? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, I think we're getting a front seat pass to that right now. Um, because Texas is more restrictive than that, I think we're in an even more bleak situation right now. Um, and I think that that would just, if, if Roe v. Wade were overturned or if the Mississippi law were, were upheld, then, I mean, we would be back in this exact situation we're in, only I don't know for how long. I mean, we don't know how long this is going to last either. But whenever we get in these situations, we know it's bleak, people are desperate, and it's dangerous. Like, th these are the things we've seen before when there have been restrictions, and this, these are the things that will happen again. So, Dr. Rubina, this must be a very difficult situation. I imagine if you're... I mean, what, what do you say to a young woman? She's pregnant maybe as the result of rape. She doesn't want to have a baby. She's only seven weeks pregnant and she's asking you for help. What can you tell her? What are her options? First, I cry with them because it's a really desperate situation and I had this exact patient. Um... In the days leading into, we weren't going to be able to get her in. We couldn't get her in in time before the law passed. And so I had been literally someone who's in school, a young person. And um, so we cry and get angry about it. And then we plan. And it's intense to try to just plan for one person to get out of the state, um, paying for their transportation, helping them get hooked up with a foundation that can give them money to get there, um, making sure that they have a safe ride and then a safe ride back making sure the clinic they're going to has an appointment for them. Like all of those logistics for one patient are incredible, but that's what we have to do. Dr. Jessica Rubino, good to get your insights on this. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Now, an update for you on a story that we talked about last week. Claims which first surfaced in the New York Times that an American military drone strike in Kabul just days before the US withdrawal late last month was a case of mistaken identity, resulting in 10 innocent civilians, seven of them children, being killed. This week, the US commander in Afghanistan, General Frank McKenzie, announced the result of their review of the incident. Our investigation now concludes that the strike was a tragic mistake. General McKenzie maintained that this operation was not rushed, that they had been observing their target for eight hours on the day of the strike. However, Defence officials now concede the driver of the car they were following, Zamari Amadi, a long-time worker for a US aid group, had nothing to do with Islamic State. At the time of the strike, based upon all the intelligence and what was being reported, I was confident that the strike had averted an imminent threat to our forces at the airport. Based upon that assessment, I and other leaders in the department repeatedly asserted the validity of this strike. I am here today to set the record straight and acknowledge our mistakes.
the US is now considering paying compensation to Ahmadi's devastated family, several of whom had already applied to go to the United States before this attack because of Ahmadi's links to America. But the story doesn't even end there. The US military says it is satisfied that Ahmadi was not planning a bombing and they now concede he was just running errands. It was his job. Picking up a laptop computer for his boss, bringing containers of water home for his family. However, the US military believes that one of the stops that Amadi made was at an ISIS safe house in Kabul. The owners of that house deny that. They say they've lived there for 40 years and now, because of this allegation, they are at risk of reprisals from the Taliban for being associated with both the United States and ISIS. Well, miss, uh, it gets worse as well, because back in August, Jen Psaki used this drone strike in particular as evidence that America could maintain its influence in Afghanistan even after they left. And what we've seen over the past week is that uh, our over-the-horizon capacity can work and has worked in going after ISIS targets and killing people who went after our troops. So much for their over-the-horizon capacity. Even worse, it turns out that the original ISIS suicide bomber that this drone strike was in response to was actually incarcerated in Bagram Prison. And he only escaped on, wait for it, August 15, when America deserted Bagram in a rush unnecessarily. So they were the ones that let the suicide bomber go. Not good. One more piece of rotten news. We've been speculating for a month now about how many Afghanistan war helpers were successfully evacuated by America in those last few weeks, the so-called special immigration visa holders. Well, this week we finally found out. Of the over uh, 60,000 individuals who've, brought, who've been brought into the United States, approximately 3% have been individuals who are... Um, in receipt of their special immigrant visas. And bear in mind, all the special immigration visa holders went to America, not mm. nowhere else, OK? So if you do the maths, that's about 2,000 special immigration visa holders who got away from the Taliban. We're not sure how many SIV holders there are left in Afghanistan. Could be anything from 20,000 to 50,000. Either way, 2,000, not very many to get away. Let's move you on up to a fire, John. Oh, that's so much better by the fire, Chaz. We're about to take a couple of weeks off we are. in America. And fortunately, we have timed it very, very carefully so that nothing is really <laughs> going to happen. Um, the United States uh, may hit its debt ceiling and tank the global economy. Uh, the United States government may itself be shut down, meaning that social security checks don't get sent to, uh, to the elderly. Uh, uh, we, we could also see Joe Biden's entire domestic spending agenda scuttled. But apart from that, it's going to be pretty quiet, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, look, where do we start? Let's start with uh, the Democrat agenda, OK? Yeah. All right, so we got this standoff. Do you remember there was a, a bipartisan bill? Yes. Uh, the infrastructure bill? Yes. That was that had already been passed through the Senate. Yes. And they all, also want to pass this, the left want to pass this, this, this uh, uh, three and a half trillion bill with all of Biden's agenda in it. Okay. Everything that they couldn't get into the $1.9 trillion infrastructure okay. bill. Okay, so they need 50 votes in the Senate to make that happen. Kirsten Sinema has apparently said to Joe Biden that if the House delays its scheduled September 27 vote on the bipartisan infrastructure plan that we just talked about, or if the vote fails, she will not be backing a reconciliation bill. Yeah. Okay? So, so they need to get that vote happening on the bipartisan bill on September 27, right? Yes. Okay. Meanwhile, the left in the House have said this. More than half our members will not move the bipartisan bill without the reconciliation bill being passed. Okay. So, that, just to translate, the Conservatives, in particular Kirsten Cinema, are saying, we will not pass, I will not pass your lefty bill unless you pass our righty bill. The the left are saying, we are not going to pass your righty bill unless you pass our lefty bill. Has to be on September, September 27, because that's the deal that's been done. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be ready on September 27. Mm. Well, over to you, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> on all of this, because uh, clearly there is this, you know, the Democrats on the one hand, you've got the moderates in the Senate who 
were very happy with the bipartisanship they got from Republicans in the Senate on the smaller bill, but there's bigger bill, and how big is it going to be? Is it going to be three and a half trillion? Is it going to be two trillion? Is it going to be one trillion dollars? And all of that is happening, of course, at a time when these other fiscal issues are swirling around. This question of America hitting its its debt ceiling, and this is a this is a sort of a self-made crisis. This is the ticking time bomb that is America's collective credit card limit that they either suspend the need to, to do something about or they kick the can down the road for a little bit. Same with the government shutdown. This is something, again, which is just about sort of the weekly spend of the government. Pass a, a, a continuing resolution on some, on some budget bills. You can keep national parks open. You can keep things chugging along. It is no coincidence that, yes, these two bills were linked because you had the left and the right arguing over, well, you go first, you go first, no, let's do it all together. But we've got these other crises going on in the background, which is all about, to an extent, the Republicans saying, we, we got a, we got a problem with money in this country right now. We don't want you spending $3.5 trillion on this social program bill. Uh, so it's a, yet another kind of a, a, a piece of leverage to say, shrink it down, shrink it down, shrink it down. Meantime, Bernie Sanders is there saying, I still want $6 trillion. We should say, by the way, that the debt ceiling argument they're having is about Money that's already been spent. Oh, yeah. Money that Republicans Trump spent money. as well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and like, Bush money. It's, it's just about actually just paying for the money that they already spent. Yeah. Just honouring their debts. Yeah. That's what it's about. Although I do get the sense, though, Chairs, that... And, and Joe Biden had uh, Premier Jayapal and, and Kirsten Sinema and a bunch of uh, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, to the White House on Wednesday of this week, in between the whole United Nations General Assembly debacle with Afghanistan and France and Australia and submarines and everything else. He took time out to get right in the middle of all of this because at the end of the day, this is what Joe Biden loves doing. 36 years in the Senate, eight years as, as VP. He's all about haggling with Congress. I think he's probably loving this right up until the moment that it all falls apart. Well, I want to see him haggle with this. This is Mitch McConnell's logic mm. for why he isn't going to vote for the debt ceiling at the moment. His logic is, let me make it perfectly clear, the country must never default. Okay. The debt ceiling will need to be raised. Okay. So the only issue is, whose responsibility is it to do it? A Democrat president, a Democrat house, a Democrat senate. We have opposed virtually everything they've done this year. It's their obligation. <laughs> they should step up. It's hard being the majority. They're the ones who will raise the debt limit. So he's saying it has to be done. Yeah. We're not doing it. We're not going to help you. And, Thanks, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so you get the situation where if they don't somehow, somehow bite the bullet and do it, America goes into default. Over the last nine years on this program, we have seen this game of chicken be played yes. a number of times. We've also seen the person get hit by the truck in that metaphor a number of times <laughs> as well. But look, before we go, yeah. let's bust some malarkey. That's a bunch of malarkey. And here's Donald Trump's former national security advisor, General Michael Flynn, on a very Trumpy cable news show this week. You know, somebody sent me a thing this morning where they're talking about putting the vaccine into salad dressing. Or salads. Have you seen this? Yes. Have you seen this? I mean, it's and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, th th I'm, this is the bizarre world, right? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He. The funniest thing about that, though, is he's kind of right. Uh -huh. Researchers are looking at ways of turning edible plants like lettuce and spinach into what they describe as mRNA vaccine factories. So it is not the salad dressing, but it is the salad leaves. I mean, these people are seriously thinking about how to impose their will on us uh, in, in our society and it's and it's take away your freedom of choice Th that's going to be untrue americans don't eat salad <laughs> exactly <laughs> if there is going to be a conspiracy you'd, you'd make it hamburgers surely <laughs> michael finney is wrong about that this isn't about secretly dosing people with vaccines in their salads or anything but this technology if successful would be pretty amazing it would allow plant-based vaccines to be stored at room temperature if the vaccine is in the plant itself. And then make a huge difference getting vaccines into the developing world where deep freezers for current vaccines are a real problem. Researchers say that people could literally grow vaccine plants for a variety of diseases in their own gardens, take care of themselves, or farmers in the developing world could be producing fields of it for their communities. Again, helping to vaccinate the world. So this is a good science news story which, of course, in the current conspiracy-minded bizarro world in which Mike Flynn occupies is going to just have Americans shunning salad bars. It's malarkey! <laughs>
That is it for another trip to Planet America. We have got a short program break. We'll see you back here Friday, the 15th of October. Check out Planet America on Facebook, YouTube and ABC IV for extra stuff and longer interviews. Those abortion interviews are good. I'd watch them. Plus, I'll have the pet podcast and usual pod places there. Also, thanks for the shirt, Dennis. And most importantly, go dogs! Mine, Dennis. Where's mine? Hi.